Uh, good afternoon. My name is Quincy Koziel. I am, I forgot to put my title in there, uh, Principal Data Architect at uh, NERSC at LBL and have come today to help give you guys a bunch of um, information towards getting HDF5 to be scalable for your applications on the HPC systems that we have today and maybe a little pointers towards what's coming along in the future. So first off, um, some background here. If, if you use HDF5 today, can you raise your hand? Uh, have these. That's pretty good. All right. Um, great. So I won't spend a tremendous amount of time here. It depends on the audience sometimes how long we can talk about the background and information. But maybe this will fill in some gaps for you um, as we go along through this little bit of intro part. So, you know, why are we using HDF5? Why, um, and Rob gave a great intro into this um, earlier, you know, why do we use IO middleware libraries in general? Do you want to wrestle around with this file per processor and how do you become an expert in MPI and Lustre and GPFS in order to get your science done to, to run your applications? HDF5, the CDF, other IO middleware packages, um, try to hide all this complexity so that you can concentrate on what you're doing that's important to you, your science. Um, sometimes, we add some complexity of our own, but that's okay. We're trying to do the difficult parts and then present it up to you in some knobs that you can turn rather than uh, figuring out exactly what muster, muster looks like on this system, which is a whole lot more complicated. So a little bit of overview for HDF5, talk a little bit about data management, managing HDF5, and um, on into parallel from there. So what is HDF5? What is a funny acronym? Uh, hierarchical Data Format Version 5. Uh, and there's a long story behind the number four and the number five part of that, and talk to me after break. I'll explain it to you. Because um, one through four were all compatible, and five was something completely different. It was like a Monty Python skip. skip. Um, so fundamentally, HDF5 is composed of these three levels. Uh, at the very bottom is the open file format. There's this file spec out there. People have written Java and other uh, libraries to go interpret the HDF5 files and actually read and write them uh, strictly from the file format spec itself. So I know that it can be done. If our Git repo gets eaten by a bear, um, somebody, somebody will be able to reproduce things and get your data back. On top of that is the open source software package and all the infrastructure around that. Um, we'll talk a lot more about the, the software and, and how to program to it in a little while, but it's obviously open source, free for everyone to use. There's interfaces in all kinds of languages, whatever you choose to use. But at the top level, there's this data model. How do you think about your data using HDF5? And we'll talk a little bit more about what does that mean and, and what are the parts to HDF5 um, so that you can compose your science models in an effective way using this package. Um, there's often this question of, well, what is HDF5? How does it relate to things like XML? XML is very descriptive. It has these extensible typing systems. It has rich metadata. HDF5 is a lot like that. It's also like your binary flat files. XML's text, HDF5 and binary are clearly uh, much more denser, scalable, much more compact, easy to parse. You know you can do fixed offsets inside these arrays and things like that. HDF5 is also a lot like PDF. It's a very standardized exchange format. Uh, sometimes we talk about it as HDF5 is the PDF of science in some ways. Um, you can mix different things together in there, you know, images and text and whatever. HDF5 is also very similar to your file system. It's hierarchical. You can create collections of related things, add attributes on top of them, structure it in some nice graphical way. Um, in some ways, don't take this too far, it's a little bit like a database. You can do random access, subsetting of things. We don't do all the atomicity and isolation, no acid properties here. But there's some aspects of how HDF5 works that make it similar to databases. So it's similar to all these things, and we took kind of all the best, best ideas we could come up with over the last 20 plus years, um, and that's what we're trying to uh, help encourage you guys to use. So it's clearly designed for high volume complex data, HPC, right? Uh, it's portable. We had folks at uh, Nokia porting it to um, what you call it, feature phones. There was some weird data gathering thing they were sending out into the snow, and they were using cell phones as the data gathering thing. It's very weird. It's like, can you do this in 16 bits? I said, well, yeah, but no one does, does that. Said, well, we have this problem. Um, 
All right. Um, and then clearly all the way up into the top 500, right? Anywhere in between. We retired the vax, no more vaxes. Um, that's flexible, it's very efficient, it tried to be. Uh, hopefully we separate the applications from their use of HDF5 so you can evolve. And we're geared for the long term. A lot of the funding for HDF Group, the nonprofit that helps maintain this, is from NASA. They'd like all their weather data from the satellites back in 50 years, so that's like, really important. So um, a lot of what we do is actually geared towards making certain that we don't lose anything and you should get your data back and we don't change things in non-backward compatible ways. <sighs> There's a lot of people that use HDF5. It's built into all kinds of um, software packages. Lots of chunks of the US government are using it, NSF, NASA, everything else, DOE of course. Um, lots of middleware built on top of it, science all over the world. Um, is depending on this. There's probably on the order of millions of users of HDF5 all across the ecosystem. So starting at the top with a data model, fundamentally HDF5 files are really containers. Uh, they hold all these data objects in some nicely structured way, not this pile in a box, right? Um, the pieces that are composed, the building blocks that we have here, um, Data sets, groups, and attributes will be your major things that you work with for HTF5. We'll cover those in more detail. Um, links, data types, and data spaces, and of course the file itself is the container. Uh, I'll touch on those if you really have some question about some complicated data type thing or how do I link all these groups together in some funny way. Uh, just come talk to me. I'll be here through the early evening uh, to help answer questions. So those are our fundamental things. At the core, at the center of dealing with HDF5, data sets. Um, data sets organize and contain data elements. They're fundamentally an array data model. Multi-dimensional array, any number of element, or dimensions you'd like, up to 32. I've not yet found a good purpose for more than like five. Some guy wanted infinite, and I told him no. Um, 32 seems to be like a reasonable enough upper limit that people throw up their hands at some number and say fine, it's good enough but it's just an array. Everything in there is an identical type. Of course, the values will be different in the array. Um, so the, the data set is composed of raw data, the piece on the right, the array, and metadata. And it goes beyond the data type and the data space, but the data type describes what type is there for each element. It's a 32-bit little Indian integer, for example. Uh, it's a three-dimensional array, and the dimensions are four by five by seven. So this is metadata about your data. But the data set packages both of those things together in the file and puts them in there in a nice, portable, self-describing way so that you can come back later and say, hey, what is that data set? Oh, it's three-dimensional and the type is 32-bit Indian, or little Indian integer elements, and I know how to go read that and do something with it. Data sets have this data space that describes the logical layout of those elements. Um, you can have data sets that have no elements, if it's a flag or it's just a, a placeholder for something else. Typically, people are into either a scalar, you know, I just have a number, or a simple array, multi-dimensional, uh, as I described earlier. And at the bottom, it says maximum number of it, all this. Uh, you can have unlimited dimension arrays in HDF5s, and you can have each dimension be unlimited. So you can extend in two and three dimensions at once um, in order to hold the data if it's expanding in some unusual way. Um, typically, people have one unlimited dimension and then they're doing time, right? One slice after the other in your images or your three-dimensional models or whatever. Um, but you could make it more and it works just fine. The other half, uh, oh, sorry. Um, I mentioned this already, the data space describes the arrayness, but it also we also use them to do the selections within buffers and memory and on disk in order to actually do the transfers between um, memory and, and the file system. So it, we talk about data space having a, a um, extent, the first top half, and a selection over the course of things we'll talk about today. Data types are the elements themselves. Each element is the same type in the arrays. It's a very standard array, right? Um, integers, floats, any number of kinds of weird floats if you want. 13-bit floats with, you know, 5-bit mantises, okay. Um, 
things come off of satellites in funny ways with imaging things, right? So we wanted to be flexible enough for NASA and other places. Um, you can store your enums, pretty much anything you can imagine of and see. Um, you can store in HDF5 in some way. So summarizing all that again, this is a two-dimensional five by three array with 32-bit integers, very straightforward. This is a little bit more complicated one. Um, again, three by five, but each element is a compound type, like a struct, and the struct in this case has four fields. So a 16-bit unsigned integer, a character that reads text, right? And a letter you can read, um, not an 8-bit integer, because they're different. 32-bit um, int that's signed, and then a field that's actually an array field that has a two by three by two float 32 field. And you can make these arbitrarily nested. You could have compound fields inside your compound fields and have arrays of everything you'd like. Any questions about this? Yes, sir? So uh, does it have to be decided ahead of time? In other words, you know, if it's more like event-based data coming from a detector where you might have one particle that has many gamma rays. Right. right. But that number is not determined until that event comes in. That number of gammas could be right. zero to n. Right. You can have variable length sequences, kind of like C++ vectors, as a field or just a standalone data type in HDF5. And then you could, for example, and that, that's moderately common, um, so you'd have a one-dimensional data set with an unlimited dimension, and then you'd also have each field, each element in there be a variable length sequence of, I don't know how many gamma length, or um, gamma ray uh, records, right? Um, works just fine. Is it still performant or? We are not super organized, super uh, performant for variable length sequences of things because each one has to be kind of stored off on their own because there's no way to do those nicely in a nice packed way. Um, and it has never been a super high important feature from the HPC realm. It tends to come more from the detectors and the light sources and things like that. Um, I know how to fix it, but we'd have to like say, okay, let's go write a grant, right? I mean, you know, one of these kind of things. Um, so it, it falls in the engineering of it works, it's just not quite fast yet. So I think you can do what you want to do though. Anybody else? Yes, sir? Do you have support for hierarchical or recursive data types? Yeah, you can nest these. You could make a compound type that had fields that were compound that were arrays of compounds of variable length sequences that were whatever you'd like. Um, they have to be, you have to predefine them though. I mean, you know, all the elements are gonna be like that from the very beginning. Um, otherwise, you tend to make multiple data sets. Each one has kind of its own set of structures or you'd nest your group hierarchy in some way that might be closer to what you're thinking of with a recursive, recursive notion of things. Maybe. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So we got these great arrays, right? And we, we just stuff them in the file, right? That's easy. Well, it's fine, um, and we do do that by default. Uh, these contiguous data sets just go directly into the file. But it's kind of crummy from a perspective where I'm gonna be rewriting or updating pieces of that data set, maybe from different processes in a parallel job or just in general, sequentially. Um, and if you wanted to do I.O. on one of those pieces, those chunks that we call them, um, that would involve a lot of extra overhead from the I.O. And uh, if that happens to be the case, then you can store your data in a way that's chunked in the way your I.O. is gonna happen from each process. Um, and it's much more efficient, and it also is the mechanism that we allow for extending data sets. So once those data sets are allowed to be uh, chunked up into pieces, then we can index those pieces, and we can tell you, oh, this is the piece at this part of your um, data set, and then you can keep extending and adding rows and columns however you like. It's also how we do compression. Um, obviously, if the data is kind of variable sized, it's very difficult to seek within it. So we, we bundle it up into chunks and compress each chunk individually and then extract those and decompress them and give them back to you in, in your application. So data sets, um, 
That wraps up the data sets. Attributes are very similar, but they're more geared towards small pieces of user metadata that you'd like to say, hey, this was the run on October 13th, 2016, and here was my configuration. That's a set of uh, user metadata that you usually would want to put in an attribute. They have, typically have a name and a value pair. Um, so, you know, run name, date, all these names, and then you associate a value with them. The values are small, multi-dimensional arrays, and as I say, they decorate those objects. Um, they're very similar to data sets. They have a data type and a data space the same way, so you can describe that arrayness. And you can see how scalar data spaces are a little more applicable towards um, attributes than they are in data sets all the time, but they work well here. And like I say, uh, they're very similar, but they don't, uh, we don't support partial I.O. We assume it's small to begin with, so you're just gonna yank out the whole 20 bytes or whatever you'd like. Uh, and compressing them and extending them didn't make a lot of sense, uh, so we don't allow that as well. But you can attach attributes to any object in the file. The data sets that we just covered, as well as the groups I'm gonna to touch on here in a minute as well to kind of add that structure and metadata to your file. So groups in a file organize things. It's like directories in your file system, right? You don't just want this pile of things laying on the ground, everybody all at the root uh, of your file system. You want to have some level of structure so that you can tell, oh, this is the pieces that came off the visualization, this is my simulation output. Um, maybe there's some shared pieces in here. This lat long temp is designed to have pointers from both the visualization and the simulation uh, groups so that you can indicate, yeah, this, that's indeed shared. And so HDF5 allows you to share with hard links effectively um, between two groups. You can even point at, as you might see here on the right-hand side, the um, data set off in the other container. You can have links to objects that are in other containers, including groups. So you can nest out your hierarchy in, in whatever way and don't have to hold it all within one petabyte sized you know, file that you'd like. So, uh, well, everybody, uh, every HDF5 file starts with that root group, and so that's, if you, by default, if you just go create file and data sets in an HDF5 file, they'll end up there. You have to explicitly create your own group structure of yourself. So before we talk about the software, any kind of the high-level data model pieces? More questions? Uh, do links fall in this area, or are they more specific to the data set? No, they're, they're basically part of the group grouping you know, hierarchy construction uh, pieces of HDF5. They're, um, each group contains, let's put it that way, um, a set of links. So this, this viz group here has four links, right, to different things. The root group has two links, but they point at groups and not data set objects themselves. Just build it out like that, basically a lot like a file system. Yes, sir? Is the compression all like per data set, or can you uh, do it like per group? Or, like, like if, for example, you have a number of uh, time steps you want to like mm -hmm. take advantage of, like, like correlation between adjacent time steps. We uh, HDF5 compresses per data set, so there are some correlations, and sometimes that's valuable. If it turns out that you do have a time sequence that is compressible in a nice way like that, it might be useful to put them all in the same data set create chunks that were sensible along that dimension, and then you probably would be able to uh, get some good you know, compression factors out of that. Do you, is it like you just specified where the chunks are? Yeah, you, uh, you say 10 by 10 by 10, or three by two by 200, or whatever. Right. And there's a variety of plugins for compression mechanisms as well. You can gzip things or apply your own special one or whatever you found off the net, these kind of things too. So software package, the next layer down. Uh, if you really do want um, to go look at the home page, I, I suggest that heavily. Uh, there's hundreds of pages of documentation and good examples up there. You want to go over to the HDF Group's website. Um, 1.10.1 .1 is actually out. I should update this. 1.10.2 is on its way sometime this fall. Uh, the software, as I say here, is written in C. There's wrapper APIs in any language you can imagine. You know, the ones I have here, Pascal, Ada, Ruby, you know, whatever you want. MATLAB, R, all kinds of great stuff. Um, the distribution has a bunch of 
command line utilities for doing kind of basic inquisition of your file and kind of converting it into text with the dump tool and things like that, um, as well as compile scripts that are kind of like MPICC to help you remember all the libraries that everything comes along. We do provide um, pre-built binaries generally for a lot of Linux systems, the Mac, Windows. Uh, if it gets really weird, then it's probably not there, but uh, kind of the mainline stuff is there. Um, and it does depend on some of the compression libraries as so we try to not roll everything into one giant package for you. Generally speaking, I'd suggest starting with the examples here at the bottom. If you want to go get into how do I write an HDF5 program, I'll, write, I'll show you some simple ones here, but there's dozens and hundreds there. Um, if you'd like to kind of look at the structure of a file in a nice graphical way, the Java browser is an excellent way to get into that. Or the dump tool it comes with the command line, it's a command line tool with a distribution um, and just kind of displays the output on your screen in your, te in your text window. Um, I mentioned earlier the compile scripts that help bundle all the libraries and dependencies for include files and things together it makes it a little simpler to compile your, your first set of applications. I don't know that you would want to necessarily roll those into a very large application suite that you're working on, but they're a good starter package and it's not too hard to get the right include files and libraries along the way. Yes, sir? Mac utility. Um, yes. On the last slide. And yeah. I, so I've been using pie tables recently for my, mm -hmm. my results management. Um, and when I delete things, right, the size keeps growing. I mean, so yes. that you always have to repack. Is that, is that true? Well, yes and no. With the 110 release, there's an option that you can turn on that says, hey, track the free space in this file. And so that when you do delete things um, or recompress data when you overwrite it in the data set, um, it'll track where all the free space is internally, and it should reduce the amount of impact uh, that the free space fragmentation and, and um, lossage is, in the file is, and you probably won't need repack as much. It still, it's nice and useful because eventually you kind of fragment up your free space enough that, you know, I, I don't need three bytes, I need 300 or whatever, right? Um, so repacking it every once in a while. But the 110 library should, should help push that down and, and keep track of all the space in the file much more productively for you. Anything else? Okay. So, diving down a little bit further into the actual programming and APIs. Like good scientists, we make layers, uh, good computer scientists. So, at the very top level, we expect people to be interacting probably with some nice high level uh, library that is more close to your uh, science domain. That CDF4 is up there, it's very close to the climate domain and is a nicely structured, as, as, as Rob was saying, constrained programming model uh, for dealing with things. The command line tools and the Java browser are kind of up to that level too. Um, lots and lots of things are built at that level. It's what we kind of push people towards something that's nicely domain specific. Programming to the, the main API, the language specific APIs, it's fine as well, it's just a little bit more details to keep track of. Um, basically, there's two, level, two pieces to that API. There's things that go in the file, in the data model objects we've been talking about, and then there's a lot of tunable properties. We have more knobs than you can look at. There's probably like two, 300 functions for, hey, twist this. Um, don't jump in with those. I've got some examples here. You can write an HDF5 program in like eight lines of code. Um, it's not that hard, it gives you very nice standard output um, as a result. All kinds of guts happen in the middle, it's probably 300,000 lines of code in the C library that just is invoked by the main API. And at the bottom we invoke uh, one of these virtual file drivers to do either POSIX IO if it's a serial program, or MPI, invoking MPI's um, uh, I.O. layers um, collectively or independently, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. And you can write your own custom uh, drivers, send data over the network or get data from you know, the web or whatever, all kinds of crazy things that people do. So there's a set of pluggable mechanisms in, involved in pieces of this that you can interact with as well. I think I mentioned a lot of this. Um, everything under the sun, you can program with it. In general, in the C routines, the main library that it has the maximum amount of features available to you, not everything gets the Java wrapper, it just doesn't happen. Um, 
everything begins with H5 is kind of a namespace. Um, and then that question mark is the character that deals with the interface. Data sets are D, files are F, properties are P, data spaces are S, um, D was taken. Um, so, as I said, there's a lot of routines. Don't get overwhelmed. It's pretty easy to get started. And like most programming things that you get into, you kind of go, oh, I need something that does this. And you, you ask a question, or you look back in the manual, and you, and you add up your knowledge. So from programming perspective, it's very C. You know, you open or create something. You access it to do things. You close it. It's very straightforward. If you want to modify that some, it's kind of like the info object for MPI or in HDF5 thing, it's properties. Um, you can modify the behavior of the call you're making right now. So if you want to chunk a data set, you do that creation time on the data set create call and you pass in a property that says, please chunk this one, please, with this dimensionality to the chunks. And then you can also non-permanently, like during this I.O., I'd like to do independent I.O. or collective. So those are access properties. They're transient runtime things that aren't persisted in the files that you create. Looks a lot like this. Here you go, see? Seven calls. So create a file or open one that you already have. I'm assuming we're creating one here. Um, create a data space to describe the arrayness. There's a whole bunch of predefined data types for you. You can say integers. 32-bit integers on this platform, so native int in, in HDF5 terms. Um, but I don't know how big your arrays are. So you gotta define, this is a three-dimensional array, it's 100 by 100 by 200. Um, so that's why that's kind of an oddball sticking out here. So you create your data space, you probably use one of the predefined data types, but you could generate your own if you'd like. Um, then you go create your data set. You read or write to it, if it's an existing one or you're writing to a new one, you shut everything back down, close it all up. Very straightforward, very C. Um, there's no destructors, everything has to be done explicitly. If you leave something open, it will dangle on you. Uh, it won't get hurt, you know, if, if you run off the file and you don't close your data set and you forget stuff, we hook into the, the uh, runtime of the C program and we'll shut it all down at the very end for you. Um, you may kind of go, why is HDF5 using so much memory? And it's probably because you forgot to close an identifier. Um, but we'll fix it for you. It just might take a little. So, any questions about the basic stuff here? I'll add on some parallel stuff here in a minute or two. Okay. So, if you're dealing with data spaces, you're gonna eventually wanna do selections probably to write out part of a data set or read in from uh, one. So you need to query the data space from disk to, you know, say, hey, this is a data set, tell me the dimensionality of it. Uh, data types, all the T routines, create new ones if you really want to create a struct or an array type or something that's not predefined. Groups to create open close, pretty straightforward. Data sets are, like I say, a lot like data types, only simpler, I mean data sets, only simpler. Um, so you create, read and write to those. Property this is where the main action is if you're gonna go twist a knob, so that's where you wanna look at if you have some question about chunking or compression, that's what the deflate one is there. So, forward into parallel, HDF5. Sometimes I talk about data, right, and metadata for because it gets a little dicey inside parallel HDF5. We need to do certain things with your file, and we call them metadata, and people are like, what are you talking about? Um, so it's the pieces of the file that aren't your array. It could be just names of the file and the group structure, but there's also like B trees and other things underneath the covers that we're keeping track of the chunks and trying to traverse the group hierarchy. That's metadata too. So um, the attributes, also metadata, kind of at the highest level, the user data. So if you have a question and I look can, you know, like I'm being confusing, please just stop me and try to help me explain that. So we're here for parallel I.O. That's today, right? Um, don't do file per process, please. Okay. So talk a little bit more in an hour, right, well, I got 45 minutes, okay. Um, 
some differences between parallel and serial. I'll show you a bunch of optimizations that are in the works, particularly recently. And we'll talk about the trade-offs for collective and independent I.O. I don't go into really gory detail. I can, but it would take another couple hours, right? So don't talk about the consistency semantics. If you go, well, you know, how am I certain that this process wrote that and that process can see that? There's a way you can get that to be absolutely known. We take care of almost 99% of it, but you can box yourself into a corner occasionally. Um, I don't talk about the metadata consistently, see an awful lot. There's advanced topics. Happy to talk to you later, and this evening, whenever you want, just come see me. So when you build HDF5 and you include the parallel builds in there, it's gonna depend on MPI. And we're assuming that multiple MPI processes are actually trying to write to at least those MPI processes are writing to a single file. You could set up bunches of them, subset the, your uh, application's data if you'd like, that's fine. Don't do file per process. Uh, underneath the covers, we always rely on MPI I.O. If it's not there, you're not gonna get parallel I.O. We've talked about some ways to go work around that, but the last 20 years, it just hasn't played out very well. MPI um, is what really what we leverage heavily. About every year or two, I send bugs to Rob and say, I broke in pitch, and he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> Let me go find that, because uh, it's usually really bad. Um, the, the files that you produce with uh, parallel HDF5, exactly the same as the ones you get with serial HDF5. You can look at them on your laptop later, you can run MATLAB on them or whatever, play with them you like, and the reverse, right? If you produce something somewhere else, you can always analyze it or ingest it into your parallel application just as well. So it'll look a lot, the parallel HDF5 API is the standard HDF5 stuff with a few extra tweaks. Um, and you can take that bottom line as kind of a, yeah, or an it, right? I mean, it's 300 uh, different functions or so, right? It's as user-friendly as it was before, just a little bit more. So this is what we had before. Create everything, read and write. Close everything down. Well, I don't like that transition, but fine. Um, I'll show you the augmentation of that in a minute for um, parallel. But when you're dealing with your application, this is what it looks like. Um, your app's running across all the compute nodes at the top. They make HDF5 calls. We rely on MPI, right? Um, it creates some HDF5 file in the parallel file system. And below that, there's more magic that's gonna happen here. I'll talk a little bit about how that looks and what some of the trade-offs are. Um, underneath the covers, your file is being striped across a bunch of stuff, right? The luster striping and other things like that. So when we talk about API, we sometimes have to get into some of these gory details, but most of the time we hide them from you. So your application, the simplest one, is very simple, very, similar, I mean, to your standard HDF5 one. So all these black lines are what you would write for a serial program, and the red ones add in what you need for parallel. So MPI init and finalize out of my scope, but you gotta have them. Then if you want to do parallel I.O., you need to create one of these file access property lists, F-A-P-L, FAPLs, we call them a lot of the time, um, and pass in the communicator and the info object that you want to use for your file when, when you're creating that with HDF5. So you pass those into this file access property list that you've created, and then you take that file access property list and you pass it into your file open or your create. And then inside HDF5, we go, oh great, this is parallel. And we duplicate the common info objects and we're ready to go with collective IO when it's time. Do the rest of your setup the way you would normally, create your data set, and then you say, hey, I'm doing parallel I.O. in my application. I would like to do collective I.O. So in order to do that, that's a runtime property, is transfer and data set transfer property list is what you need to create. Um, so we're in the property list, it's the H5P, right? And you're gonna say, hey, for this data set transfer property list, I would like my MPIO to be collective. Default state independent, which is an important thing to remember. Um, and then you pass in that property list, that XF ID, the transfer ID, to your dataset write, 
and collective I.O. is what you get out the bottom. Everybody stitches it together inside MPI, does the right. Any questions about that core programming piece of things? Yes, I don't have a question, but I just want to point out that that one line, the H5 piece at the exploit of the I.O., is usually the magic line that makes things go fast on supercomputers. Yes. HDFI code. I'm not getting good performance. I have one line, you know, double performance. Or triple performance. Maybe it's, it's, it's rich dry sometimes. So uh, the, the opt in, I know why they did the opt in. I just wish it was more opt out. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Or perhaps more like um, MPI where you'd say write and write at all. Or something, you know, where you explicitly were more collective so you knew what was happening right from the right call. We, we've debated that one a number of times <laughs> all over the place. Yeah, well, kind of, but there's kind of confusion that you generate when you don't do that. But you get the flexibility, so it's kind of a trade-off. <coughs> Somebody else, I thought, yeah? So are, uh, is data then written in the same order as it would be done in serial? So, or is it part of the HDF5 metadata, which part is where in the coming memory block? As part of what you'll do, um, one of these, uh, dot, dot, dots, right, is the selection that you make for each process. You probably want each process to have a different place in the array in the file that it's going to put its memory in. You know, it's part of its buffer into those places. So I cut it out here, but each process will make a selection in the file of the place it's going to drop its, its elements. And then as part of that write call, MPI will gather all those buffers together, stitch them into a, what looks like would normally be a C standard uh, serial I.O. looking file, but it does it all in the fast parallel collective way. Basically, if I define that based on process IDs, I can be sure that um, that big block of data, if I read it afterwards in parallel, that it has been contiguous memory in the way I designed it. Yes, exactly. Right. We stitch it all back together. There's a lot of flexibility in there, too. So you can almost always get your pattern in memory for however you've subdivided your array or your mesh um, into disk in some nice contiguous way overall. Anyone else? I'm sorry, what? Sorry, I'm not even confused. So there's this virtual file layer that you have MPI there. Kind of like IO driver. And is this? This one? No, no, no. I see. Um, one of the first slides when you explained like the oh, yeah, like SDFI. Like uh, this one. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, right. so this is like on HDFI level, and then that, the other one is kind of like a branch of it. Or, well, or, or it's the same. It's just an It's the same. Thing. I just labeled the layers a little differently. This, this layer here is what talks to that MPI layer on the slide we were just on. And then it drops through the MPI I.O. there inside MPI library down into the parallel file system. So I smooshed a bunch of stuff together here for this one. So it's the same thing. Just yeah, yeah. The parallel HDFI is kind of like talking to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Very much. Okay. Keep going. Anything more? Just let me know when you want. So um, when you deal with an HDF5 file, um, parallel HDF5 is going to open a shared file. Everybody's doing, whoever is in that communicator, it doesn't have to be com world, right? You can subdivide your communicator in, into smaller groups if you like, but everybody's in that communicator is going to be dealing with that file for that MPA, or file handle for HDF5. Um, and so obviously, you, if you want to talk to that file, you can go through that. Um, theoretically, um, MPI can handle multiple writing into the file, but HDF5 will get confused. It's trying to manage its metadata in ways behind your back to do it efficiently in high performance, so don't double open your file and do funny things in this. Um, when you do collective I.O., we really mean it. Um, even if this process doesn't have any data to write, if you're doing a collective I.O. operation from everybody else, you just make a null selection here in this process, you know, whatever rank that is, and you participate in the I.O. Because we're going to do communication underneath the covers, or MPI will, and you're going to hang if you don't get that 
rank into the, into the uh, I.O. operation when you say collective. It means collective. Everybody has to come through there. Um, it may not synchronize you, or it may, but you have to go through that hoop altogether. And one final thing here, I'll talk about a little bit about this, um, maybe later too. But if you're creating structural things in the file, creating a new data set, creating a new group, an attribute, um, extending a data set's dimensionality in the file, the unlimited dimension for the data spaces, right? Those things have to be all collective so that every process involved in dealing with that file understands the changes that are happening here. There is no server in HDF5 land. So everybody has to share that common knowledge, and you do it by everybody participating together. So you can't create a group on one rank and not on the other guys. Eventually, your application will hang. And it's really annoying, because it hangs like 30 calls later, right? When I'm trying to write out metadata, and all of a sudden the synchronization isn't right, and the, the I.O. calls get all confused, and the internal communication, very confusing. Sorry. But... Um, you got to keep it all together. So just keep it in mind. Try to, all your data set creates happen on all the processes. Any questions about that one? I mean, I've debugged this a number of times and helped people go, what's going on? Uh, okay. Here's where you go for a bunch more parallel um, programming tutorials for uh, HDF5. Um, lots and lots and lots of information here. I'll cover simple stuff here, but there's bunches of things to get to. Um, and here is where I was going earlier, where the file system is underneath the covers doing things to you. If you've got a very large file, I'm just trying to talk a little bit about efficiency in, in doing your parallel IO, right? Um, it's getting chopped up into multiple pieces to stripe across the, the uh, storage servers underneath and um, unless you take some precautions, HDF5 doesn't know what's going on. It doesn't know that the striping factor is a megabyte or whatever. It's just going to lay things out according to the way it thinks should happen. And so that might fall right in the middle of your data set, or your metadata gets divided off into two stripes and it impacts your performance. Um, it's, not, it's even worse, in a sense, when you think about how do we deal with the metadata for this data set that actually is pointing at the raw data for that? They could get separated out or misaligned or something. And then when you chunk it, all those chunks get strung out all around the underlying file as well. So there's some B tree that we use as the chunk index, and that points off into different chunks. And they may not even get stored in the same order. The file systems tend to freak out sometimes. Um, there's call in HDF5 is a P set alignment, H5P set alignment. And that helps you to align the I.O. that you want to write with the underlying block size here in the file system. It'll say, for everything over 500 bytes, it's a reasonable number for your chunks, right? That's the metadata gets sifted down into one place. Everything over 500 bytes, align that on a one megabyte boundary. And that way, you can be certain that your chunks and your maybe contiguous data sets, are getting lined up with the nice luster striping that's happening underneath the covers for everything. So just be cautious when you think you're laying things out in some nice way. HD5 is doing some advanced stuff underneath the covers for you. Well, this just reiterates that. So touching on the collective thing again. When we say collective, you gotta get it all there, and you gotta do it in the right order, right? If process, first process is calling A, then B, you gotta call A, then B. Um, if you flip it around, B happens over here, and it's probably not gonna happen, because it's waiting for something to happen on A, and it's gonna hang on you. General MPI programming stuff, right? But it can be confusing, because like I say, if you don't create your metadata properly, we hang like, 30, 40 calls later, and you're very confused. All right, so when it's collective, you gotta put everybody there and do it all together. A um, little bit of statement about, I covered this mostly already, metadata versus data. Uh, we expect the, the data in your data sets to be large, right? Gigabyte, petabyte. 
Um, and we're going to do independent and collective there. Um, that's very user controllable, and the metadata is a little less so, but we give you some knobs. I'll show you the performance benefits for those. Uh, I talked about modifying uh, metadata. That has to be collective. I think we've hit almost everything else here. Definitely want to use the latest version of the library, and there's some flags in there to say, use the latest version of the format. Sometimes you can, if you've got a lot of objects stored in a group, a lot of data sets that you're creating for something, um, anything over about 100 or 200, you want the latest version of the library. It's a nice improvement in the underlying data structures. It gives you sometimes 10x performance in working with that group, right? Cautionary tale too, right? You're dealing with something that's way up here. We got through this layer, which is complicated. We're complicated, this is complicated, this is complicated. Oh my goodness, this is complicated. And then down into the hardware, right? Um, so when you're trying to say, why is this slow, where is my problem? Um, it could be in a lot of places. It's not like you're just getting bad performance from doing POSIX writes to the hardware, and you're only really dealing with the luster in, in the storage hardware layer, right? There's, there's some slippery places in, in all the layers that you're dealing with here in the cake. So we'll talk a little bit about how do you help diagnose problems and instrument things. Um, this is classic textbook. The numbers are really dated, but it was really nice 10 years ago, right? Um, it's fine. It's the same problem today, just the numbers are bigger. It doesn't matter. So this user had some simple data gathering problem that he was working on. Six columns, 230,000 rows in each one, uh, very tall, very skinny, right? And they were um, writing to that. I'm sorry, this should say six, or the other thing should be four, but whatever. Um, each MPI process was writing out one of those columns and we're dealing with. Um, Safe by floats, it's perfectly fine. It was writing out, it's a tiny thing, right? It's 32K. How long could this possibly take? It was taking like seconds, right? It was nuts. Um, because they weren't doing what Rob was saying, turning on the collective stuff. Um, so it was crazy, crazy bandwidth. Um, so fine, how do we figure out if that's what's happening in yours? If you turn on the debug and you enable your parallel when you build HDF5 or you get one that's built that way on the system that you have, um, we turn on a lot of tracing internally, just printfs inside HDF5. Um, you have to set your environment variable as well. And you get this nice output that says, hey, we're doing all these IOs. Um, but you can see here that yeah, every eight byte offsets, this is coming out of an MPI job, so it's not all in order, uh, we're doing eight byte writes, um, which is terrible, it's tragic, right? You're gonna get really, really, really bad performance. Um, so the user was writing these all out independently because they didn't know what was going on. If you go back and you chunk this, it helps, because then each chunk is long and skinny, right? You set the chunk size to be one by whatever, 230,000 in this case, and so every process is writing to different offsets in the chunk, but you still have four chunks that you're writing out, these numbers here, right? Um, could be better. So what happens if we do chunk and collective, and then we get flat? It's perfect, right? If we do one I.O., boom, all your data goes out to disk. So you can see how you can tune your chunking to be organized how your processes are writing your data out. If you have long, skinny columns attached to each rank, make your chunks be similar, right? Everyone always asks me this. The number one question I get, how big should my chunks be? I have no idea. I really don't. It all depends on what your application is doing, not only just now, but someday in the future, right? What are you doing now is like, you know, okay, 50 by 50 would be great. Um, but someday later, when you're doing analysis on these uh, simulation output, I don't know, 100 by 100 might be better, 100 by 200, different kinds of columns, I don't know. It really is very IO dependent, it's very application specific. If I have to suggest something to people, I suggest you make them mostly square. Don't make long skinny things unless you have a really good reason. Make them kind of, you know, 50 by 50. And if you wanna know about how big that number should be, like about like kind of the square root of your array size. So it's kind of like a thousand by a thousand. Chunk size in the like 30 to 40 by 30 to 40 would be kind of a good number to start from. So squarish, square root of your dimension, good numbers to start from. 
if you had to plug in some defaults, that's what I would do. Uh, we don't have any defaults. You have to plug them in. But if you do it right, and you do it with nice collective I.O., it's very nice, very scalable. MPI is so, so happy. It understands exactly what's going on. Your I.O. goes out really fast. I'll talk about a couple of tools here for measuring the performance for HDF5 and how you can help do them. Phil's already covered Darshan way better than I could. Um, so I'll skip mostly through that. When you're doing I.O., things are generally going to fall in one of these categories. Talked about it a little bit. It's either very nice and contiguous in both places. Um, you have a buffer in memory and you're scattering. You're gathering. Or you're doing some arbitrary mix of the two, right? So when you see these kind of things going on, your tools can help you in somewhat different ways, um, different levels of granularity. You don't want tools that measure really, really fine levels of granularity when you're dealing with lots and lots of little things getting you know, slid all over the place. You kind of want to back out a little bit. This would be fine if you just wanted to kind of get a log of what the rights are and those sorts of things. So kind of some choices of, based on your I.O. patterns, just wise things to do. Um, the HDF5 distribution comes with a tool we call H5 Perf, performance tuning, performance measuring. Um, and there's a serial version as well, so you don't have to always run things with MPI. Um, it'll let you benchmark, well, how does HDF5 compare to MPI on this system, and how does that compare to just raw POSIX writes? The output, the input parameters, you know, how big are my arrays and what do my I.O. patterns look like is always the same, but you can turn on any one of those three options. And it's probably not reality, but it kind of gives you some nice upper numbers to look at and say, well, okay, this system is running this way, and gosh, there's this weird difference between how fast HDF5 is going and, and how fast MPI is going. What's the problem? Maybe there's a bug. Maybe there's some file system issue going on. I don't know. So from a serial run, very straightforward. Uh, we're going to compare POSIX versus HDF5, and you should see something that's close. Our goal is kind of, you know, 90% of the underlying layer. Usually we're much closer than that as well if everything's working properly. For parallel runs, similar kind of thing. Um, HDF5 compared to MPI, compared to the underlying POSIX, you should see a fairly close correspondence between HDF5. It's probably a little slower, but there's a lot of benefits that you're getting for that trade-off of raw I.O. bandwidth. It usually, MPI adds a lot to the equation. Um, so you'll see that its performance is better than just doing raw POSIX writes because it does the buffer gathers and the collective I.O. and everything for you. Play with H5Perf. Phil's really covered this well. I won't go in any <laughs> further than this. Um, there's a moderately good HDF5 plugin for Darshan now. So it'll help you do um, output through the Darshan framework. Now we start performance optimizing a little bit, right? Any questions at this point? I haven't seen the HDF5 Darshan module. What kind of things do you capture? Mm. Let's talk later. More details than we want to okay. get into. Yeah. Um, so, any questions about the how do I do HDF5 parallel stuff? Or I had a problem or something funny. You guys do this kind of capability? Okay. So now we've, you're using HDF5. How do we get better performance? I've kind of been giving you some hints about alignment and some collective and choosing good chunk sizes, making certain your metadata is all together. These sorts of things will help. Um, this is an example from uh, a virtual particle and cell, particle and cell. Um, simulation that was run a couple of years ago and achieved a considerably high um, bandwidth on blue waters, uh, produced 350 ter terabyte files. Blue waters did not like that, but it was okay. Um, so again, dealing with a lot of layers that we're trying to optimize here. Um, When you, when you get this problem of, well, how do I fix this thing? And in this case, in particular, too, uh, VPIC deals with HDF5 through this particle library, H5 part. Um, it's called H5 HUT now, but um, it's like 
HPC utility kit or something like that, HUT. So it's dealing with all these different layers. It's a huge stack. So how do we get in there and measure things? How do we take um, some control over these things? In particular, too, there's this magic that happens underneath the covers. We've probably covered this in other layers of the file system stack today. Um, one of the things that happened with VPIC was like, hey, whenever I call this file and I close it, um, my performance ain't great, right? It's, you know, three gigabytes per second or something like that. And you say, well, okay, fine. Let's go in there and debug into HDF5. Figure out why it's taking so long to close the file. Well, it turns out that we truncate the file to a particular length when we're done, and we use MPI file set size. Uh, MPI file set size is a very unhappy little call on many parallel file systems. It's sort of been getting better, but if we can avoid truncating um, the file by changing the file format a little bit, our performance goes up by like a factor of six, right? Um, much, much, much more reasonable uh, scaling performance and, and uh, IO bandwidth out of this thing instead of just pausing way down here in the, in the truncate for the file. So this is something you don't directly have control over, but it's a feature that is coming along in, if not the next version of HDF5, very soon now. Um, the tests were run with a few versions back. But um, sometimes you have problems with things you do not expect to be a problem. Um, so I don't want to go into the details of why it turns out that the, uh, the truncation uh, is expensive, except to say it is. It was very sideways, unexpected kind of, wow, didn't expect that to be a problem thing. Oops. So one of the other optimizations for parallel I.O. is this multi-data set I.O. And Rob covered this earlier with kind of deferred I.O. and aggregating things in PNET CDF. Um, typically in HDF5, you're dealing HDF5 data set write, one I.O. per call on one data set. Um, however, realistically speaking, a lot of applications deal with pressure, temperature, all kinds of things per time step, right? So it would be nice if we bundled all those things together and allowed an application to bundle that into an even bigger MPI collective file write at all at the very bottom. So we are adding these two new routines, this read multi and write multi. Um, those just basically take an array of data sets and selections, buffers, everything all together, and then you get to write it in one very, very large complex I.O. call to MPI. And the performance is, of course, way better. Um, instead of doing everything individually, we get this nice, flat, scalable, yes, MPI is happy once again, right? Um, so clearly a very, very large win. This will be coming out, hopefully, again, a little bit later this year uh, in the next releases of HDF5. So another example for uh, application level things, um, CGNS is a very common standardized uh, CFD file format and library right now. Um, lots of different people use it in mostly the aerospace realm of things, NASA, Boeing, those sorts of things. Um, they had been doing their own file format for a very long time and they gradually got tired of it and put in a plugin for HDF5. And then we're starting to work through the how do we make all this work and work fast. So had been previously in this ADF file format. Um, they started shifting over to parallel HDF5, but we're kind of like, well, why is this not quite performant as much as we'd like? Uh, um, We'd still like to keep going away from our own custom format because otherwise everybody's got to write a plugin for the ADF file format and this is just a huge hassle for everyone. HDF5 is, is pretty well accepted by all the visualiza visualization and analysis tools. So we want to go this way. Um, how can we make that better? When they open an HDF5 file in CGNS, they basically do this. They read in all the data sets that they need for the CFD app. Um, but everybody was going off and reading data set A, 
all the processes were reading data set A, um, and all the processes were reading data set B, all of them together, right? So this is like a denial of service attack on your file system, okay? <laughs> um, so, and then there's a similar problem going on in, at the close side, and everybody's trying to flush everything out, but they're repeating each other over and over and over again. Um, so we went in here and added in the improvements for collective metadata, which I'll get to in a second, plus the multi data set reads and write, and you can see that the scalability was going off the charts, and now it's starting to level off. It's not perfect. Um, there's still probably some tuning room left in the CGNS, um, but you can get sizable, two orders of magnitude, um, levels of improvement with some optimization on the HDF5 code. Um, sometimes HDF5 is wrong, it's not perfect, but almost always you can get very good performance by spending some time working on it a little bit. So, a little more details about the metadata read storm thing. Um, when you write and create data sets, this is, you can't do this, a little black or red check mark. You have to create all your data sets collectively. Everybody has to create one data set and the other. But when you read, it's just fine, right? You could open data set one from rank zero and data set two from rank one. That's allowed, it's fine. Each process will go off and it'll go read that data set from disk. Or you can go collectively read these things together. But when you do the second one, that's where you do the denial of service thing, right? In particular, it looks nasty when you end up traversing a file or a group hierarchy. You know, you gotta get the information about the root group. Everybody goes and does that. Then you gotta get the information about this group. And then that group, and then this data set. It's like seven denial of service decks, um, right? So this huge read storm is a, is a thing. Um, so there's a property you can set in HDF5 that says, hey, by the way, my application does this really frequently. Turn on the collective reading and then MPI rank zero in that communicator um, will issue the metadata read and then be cast it to everybody else who's involved in that operator. Huge improvement again, right? That's just what you see. Every time you give us more information about what you're doing and we can do things smarter and use MPI and leverage the interconnect instead of the file system, um, almost always get very, very nice results. Happens on the right side too when you close the file. Um, we're trying to flush out the metadata, the cache that we keep. Um, oops. And so if you turn on the collective metadata right side of things, um, we gather all those pieces of metadata and do it in a nice collective um, right call at the very end uh, when we're closing the file and flushing the cache with all the dirty metadata. Uh, same, same chart, right? Uh, and in fact, this is the closed chart, sorry. Talked about a number of knobs to go turn. All those 300 properties, there's a property for you somewhere in there that does what you want it to do. So I can talk a little bit about what the future looks like, um, but taking questions now would be great. We've got 10, 15 minutes. Um, I talk fast. So um, if anyone has any questions or things that you'd like to, yes sir? Is there any kind of schema or validation I can run on a data set before I try reading it in to make sure I don't get to the end of it and it's missing? Um, well, missing is a little, um, the data will be there. It just might not be what you expected, I suppose. But what you want is like an XML kind of, does this file conform to the, yeah, what you want. Um, yes, in a way, but it's very prototypey. Um, it does what effectively is dump the whole file out in a, the structural bits of the file, not the data set elements. Uh, the structural bits of the file in an XML file and then use an XML verifier against that output to say, does this conform to what I want? I don't view that as a super great solution um, at scale, really. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's run up against the wall of open sourceness, right? This is a nonprofit company backing this and they can only do little bits of extra things around the edges. So if you want to write one, that would be awesome. Um, I'm certain it would be nicely accepted, right? Um, I can point you at the prototype and examples if you really want to look at them later on, but there isn't a solid binary one that just deals with the HDF5 files per se. It's been asked for like for 10 years, right? But Send me a patch <laughs> or write me a proposal. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, 
is the entire development uh, available on some public repository? So if I want to play around with the read and write multi, can I do that already now? Yes, there's a Git repo that you can get to from the, H the main HDF5 web page and download all the history with all the branches and play with the, the multi data set reads and writes if you like. That's already in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually were having some issues with closing the HDF5 file on a huge, huge run. Okay. Are there any solutions that exist now? I mean, like, what could we do, I guess, to do it as is? Well, probably the collective writing, the collective metadata stuff may help, may go a very long way. Um, the file truncation is sometimes still a problem for various people, um, but given that it's kind of a file format mod, it's been a long while getting up to production where we've been happy that changing the file format was the right thing to do. Um, I could point you at a snapshot of a prototype of that if you really want to experiment, and then you can at least play with it and say, fixed my problem, I know what I want, or didn't fix my problem, I still have something else I'm looking for. So, sure, just come talk to me afterwards. Also, I wanted to mention that there is a live help desk, a real person sitting at a desk, right, answering email and phones, don't call her. Um, send mail to help at hdfgroup.org, okay? Help at hdfgroup.org. She'll answer your question or point you at the forum for the mailing list or web pages and whatever else and try to get you the help that you need. Um, but there is really a live person that NASA pays for to sit there, you know, nine to five during the weekdays. Um, to help people out. Any more? Yes, sir. So given that the file structure is completely up to us, how does this work with visualization software? Typically, most packages um, have kind of like a profile, like Visit has certain profiles that it understands for the structural output of, you know, various applications that it deals with. Um, it can visualize those very natively. Otherwise, you gotta get in there and kind of write your own application profile to say, this data set, I want, that's a two-dimensional data set, I wanted Viz, you know, this way was an image, and this 3D one, take a slice like that, and then, you know, whatever. Um, so usually there's a little bit of fine tuning on your own, typically. And there may be some, some things that are custom already there for you, but um, give you so many tools to work with, it's really hard for the downstream end of people to really anticipate what they're gonna get. The best that you typically get is like the graphical Java browser that says, well, I'll show you the structural output, and that looks like a 2D data set, so I'll try to display it as an image for you, but if you really want something custom, you kinda gotta get in there and play with something your own. Just using something like CGNS, if it would work for us, I guess. I don't know. What are you? <laughs> yeah, that may work then. Well then. Um, like writing my own simple HDF5, full parallel HDF5 library. You should, you should try it at least first. Um, and um, if it's not obvious how to proceed, send mail to the help desk, right? Um, but CGNS is a really good starting place if you've got a, C, uh, a CFT code or any. So, yeah, definitely. Less on, on topic, but um, so yesterday we heard a lot about a lot of different like parallelization libraries apart from MPI. Okay. Do you know if any of them have had like success with performance using HDF5 parallel HDF5 without MPI with something else like a GasNet or something? <coughs> I'm not that familiar with some of those, um, and I don't think there's a GasNet plugin for HDF5. Um, you might have to go hunting around a little bit for that one. Yeah, sorry. Might not be something that's really mature or out there. Right. right. Okay. It, might not be, uh, it might be. I mean, the Python wrapper for HDF5 is a community developed, not through the HDF5, and it's great. It's a very nice wrapper for HDF5. And there are some really good third-party things for HDF5. Uh, so maybe there's something good there, but I'm, I'm just not that familiar with it. Sorry. Anyone else? You want to see the future a little bit? Um, not the big future, just HDF5 future. Um, so we, we have some funding from the ECP efforts in the DOE to tackle 
some or all of these things. Some have already been fixed, right? Uh, scalable chunk indices went out in 110, and the metadata aggregation and page buffering also in 110. This virtual data set, same. Um, but part of the ECP funding is to really productize this, what we call single writer, multiple reader, SWMR, swimmer, access pattern. And this is very nice for your facilities that are like light sources and, well, stock markets and things, right? Um, where you've got a single stream of somebody dropping data in the file and you want to go in there and data mine it to death live while the file's being updated. So Swimmer access to HDF5 will allow you to have a single writing app process and concurrently, no locking required, just go in there and look at that HDF5 file and see what's going on. So you get a very live, very high performance um, view of what's happening inside that file and you can watch the data stream come in. So. Also asynchronous I.O. is something I've been wishing to get in now for 15 years. Uh, we finally have some funding for so that you can actually issue a call to say, hey, by the way, go write that data and just tell me when it's done. I'm going to go do something else. Um, hopefully that will enable us to do a little bit more internal threading inside HDF5 so there's less concurrency issues. Um, I'm going to skip over the virtual object layer because it's complicated to talk about. Um, and it's a little lower level thing. There's nice um, prototypes for issuing queries into HDF5 files. It says, tell me all the data sets in this file or this collection of files that have a data set named pressure and contain data in the range between 50 and 100. So those kind of queries are going to get rolled into the ECP work that's coming out over this next four and a half years um, so that you can actually look at an HDF5 file and issue database-like queries into it. Um, indexes just back that up with some performance improvements. Hopefully we'll have a nice um, HDF5 client server pair that comes out so that you can send data from one facility to another facility um, and be able to, uh, again, leverage the swimmer piece so you can say, hey, this data is getting transferred over here and I'm going to read it live over the top of the multi-gigabyte uh, connection. And typically with um, Performance, here's the variable length records that we talked about for the uh, vectors and, and other things. I'd like to get that boosted up. I don't know that we have enough funding to go tackle that entirely, but it would be nice to go make that faster too. And then, of course, you know, fault tolerance is always a good thing. We'd like that to happen. It's actually a kind of a spin off of the swimmer if we're writing things into the file in this particular way that works really well for concurrent reading and writing. It also makes the file crash proof. So if the, if the writer dies at any point in time, the file is still safe. It may waste a little bit of space in the file, but it's still safe and it won't get corrupted when the writer dies. So, any questions about magic from the future? Or anything else? We got three, four minutes. I'm gonna stay around to the afternoon, or into the evening too, so if you'd like to talk about later, that's okay too. Will you be doing um, hands-on examples with HDF5 or is that Maybe that's I'll stay through the evening, and if you have questions or you want to work through the, some of the examples from the website, that would be great. Happy to help. Okay. All right. Thank you all.